Amen to that. It's good to be with you this morning, church. Still meeting many of you. Uh, I'm Cody Robertson, new associate pastor here. Uh, Jeff is at his brother's wedding. His brother got married yesterday. So Jeff is in Dubuque, Iowa. And I've driven through Dubuque, Iowa. And no matter how bad the sermon is this morning, you're in a better place than Jeff is. I really hope none of you are from Dubuque. Let's begin our time together with a word from the Lord. I invite you to uh, grab the Bibles that are uh, in front of you in your seats or on your phone and turn to Paul's letter to the Galatians chapter 6. And as you do that, would you all please stand as we read this scripture together this morning. Starting in verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. You all can be seated. Not too long ago, I was hanging out at a playground. I have a kid too, so it's not weird. I was at the playground, and I noticed a little girl over by the slide playing in the dirt. She had a monster truck, and it was a cool-looking little toy. It was black and had, like, flames on it, like decal flames on it, not real flames. And uh, there was dirt caked all over those big old monster truck tires, and she was having a, a ball playing in the dirt over there. And a little bit later, another little girl walked up to her, and I could only hear a little bit about what they were saying, but I heard, cool truck. I was like, oh, that's, that is a cool truck. And before I knew it, the second little girl had that monster truck in her hands, walked away, and started playing with it on the slide. So I looked over at the first little girl, and you could just see it bubbling up in her. She was frustrated, she was getting angry, and as it started to build, everyone at the playground could hear, that's mine! And of course, the other little girl, you know how she responded, huh? Nuh-uh, it's mine. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. But the parents stepped in, thankfully it wasn't my kid, and crisis was averted. But it's an experience we all know, right? If you're around kids in any capacity, whether they're yours, they're your nieces or nephews, your grandparents, guardians, whatever, if you were around kids, you have witnessed that scene before. And it seems like a basic kid experience that you have to learn to share and all of that, but I'm not so sure that we ever fully outgrow yelling at one another. That's mine. We're finishing up our sermon series this morning, Four Ways to Wreck Your Life. The fourth way to wreck your life is to declare what's mine is mine. The thing that changes as we grow older is that we no longer just fight over some toy and scream that it's mine, for the most part anyway. Instead, we begin declaring things as mine because we actually think it's a positive. We think these things will ultimately give us some semblance of a good life. That we will find whatever we are looking for, this fulfillment in our life, by having this thing that is now mine. What's mine is mine. Think about, for a second, fishing. All right? You know what you need to go fishing? You need a stick. You need some line. You need a hook 
and a worm. That's all you need to go fishing. So you start out and you go out there, but pretty, sure, pretty soon your hands are going to start getting tired, right? It's hard to just pull that line back in. So you go over to Walmart and you buy a cheap rod and reel. They're not too expensive at all. So you pick one up and you go back out and you're fishing again. And pretty soon, you know what happens? You don't like that rod and reel anymore. It's not fancy enough or you're convinced that it's going to break or you don't like how you set the drag on the reel. So you go over to Bass Pro Shop now because you know they got nicer stuff over there. And you pick out a fancier rod and a fancier reel. And you go back out and you're enjoying it again. Now you got your rod and your reel, you're all set, except pretty soon you start sitting there and you're looking out at the lake or the river or wherever you are and you go, you know what, I could probably catch more fish if I wasn't standing here on this bank. So you go back over to Bass Pro Shop and you find a little kayak or a little belly boat or some little thing so no longer do you have to sit with the peons over on the bank. Now you can be out in the, into the water where all the fish are. Get to the good spots. Except then pretty soon, you get tired of whatever boat you bought and you go back over to Bass Pro Shop and you see all the cool stuff they have over there and before you know it, you are no longer with a stick, a line, a hook, and a worm. Now you got a brand new Ranger Bass boat with a souped up Mercury motor, a fish finder, a tackle box that is bigger than this keyboard over here. You got a rod and a reel for every single fish or species you're trying to catch, right? And then pretty soon you realize that, that your little old Jeep Cherokee cannot tow this brand new boat that you bought. <laughs> so you go out and you buy yourself a brand new diesel truck. Got to be able to haul it around, right? And then you pretty soon, you know what happens? You go home and you start realizing that your house does not have enough room for your brand new diesel truck and your new Ranger bass boat. So you buy a new house with a little bit more room, a little bit more space, and on and on and on it goes because you think that by achieving all of those things, buying all of those things, doing all of those things, that somehow you will find what you are looking for in life. Now, of course, that's a little embellished and over the top, maybe. But you have a thing like that. Maybe it's not fishing equipment. Maybe it's your house, your car. Maybe it's your new gadget, some tech thing. Maybe it's your job. But we all have a thing like that, that we keep buying the new, better thing because we think going down that path will provide something for us in life that we are missing. And you know what you find the further down that path you get? that you are never fulfilled, that there is always something missing. This life just never seems quite good enough. Our scripture this morning, from Paul writing to the churches in Galatia, speaks directly to this, to this constant consumption that we spend so much time of our lives seeking. Paul calls this sowing to please the flesh. Which really, at its most basic level, means planting and tending to things that only benefit you. We might find countless ways to justify these things. We might say it's just how we live life, it's just what we want out of life, it makes us feel good. But ultimately, they will lead to destruction. Common English translation says verse 8 this way, those who plant only for their own benefit will harvest devastation from selfishness. I don't know what's happening to each one of you on an individual level this morning. I'm still working on your names. But if we look at our culture, if we look at all of us as a collective, we find that we just keep getting angrier and more anxious, more afraid. We have trouble being in real relationship with one another. We're disconnected and we're lonely. We bear all of this weight trying to find 
some mattering in life, some meaning. We seek it out in all sorts of areas, but yet we still find that we are deeply alienated, not just from each other, but from ourselves, from the life that we are trying to live, which ultimately means we're also alienated from God. And that sure seems like devastation and destruction to me. Paul doesn't leave us hanging, though. He calls us to a different path, what he calls in this text, sowing to please the Spirit. This sowing to please the Spirit is directly linked to what Paul says, doing good. Doing good for all people. If you don't know where to start, start with the people you go to church with. But, no matter who it is, you are called to do good. We have a pretty good idea of what that is, I think. We all care for people. We don't want people to go hungry or people to go houseless or people to not have adequate clothing. We support local schools. We work with the food bank. I encourage you to get involved with any of those ministries. We want to be a church that connects with our neighborhood, with Midtown, and Memphis beyond that. But I think what Paul is getting at here goes even deeper than that. That Paul is not speaking of just actions, but Paul is speaking of a deeper way of being in the world. A way in which you find that your life is just overflowing with the Spirit. Have you noticed here that Paul is using agricultural images? The great uh, early 2000s philosopher Joe Dirt said, life is a garden, dig it. That was a joke. <laughs> I'm going to watch Joe Dirt as a church. So. What Paul is saying here, I think, is faith is a garden. Dig it. Now, I must confess that I am not very good at growing things. I always tell people that I could kill a cactus from neglect. I have a brown thumb. Please do not buy me a live plant unless you are coming over to take care of it as well. But I think that even if that's true for you as well, we can understand the heart of what Paul is getting at here. When you grow something, what do you have to do first? First, you have to prepare your land. The past few weeks, we've been talking about brokenness and wholeness and holiness. And really, those three things are preparing the land. Brokenness is the fertilizer because it deals with the Organic matter of life, if you catch my drift. The difficulties. Wholeness is tilling the ground. Taking that fertilizer and the dirt that's already there and making something good out of it. Holiness is preparing the rows. The hard work of making space for things so that pretty soon you can sow the seeds. We were at Bible study this past week. Jeff talked about making space through silence, Sabbath, and Scripture. And once you have everything prepared, once you have the fertilizer and you've tilled the land and you've set up your rows, you can begin to plant the seeds. I don't know if you've ever watched anyone plant before or if you've done it yourself. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It is tedious work that takes a lot of intentionality. You got to put seeds in the ground, sometimes one at a time, over and over again. Wears me out just thinking about it. And then once you plant it, you have to keep taking care of it. You have to water it. You have to 
keep paying attention to the soil around it. You have to pay attention to what else might be growing out there. You have to pay attention to storms and weather and do all you can to protect what you are growing. Growing things is really hard work focused on very small actions. Paul is saying that to the Galatians. Faith is hard work. Hard work that focuses on small actions. My favorite quote that you will hear me say again over and over here. It's from Richard Beck, a writer and professor who says, being like Jesus is a million boring little things. You should write that one down. I don't think it's always helpful to just tell you exactly what that's looked like. So let's brainstorm together a normal everyday life experience that you might have where you can judge and show that you were sowing to please the Spirit instead of sowing to please the flesh. And I can't think of anything more mundane or potentially aggravating than going to the grocery store. Especially right now. Right? When you go to the grocery store, do you keep driving around row after row, just waiting for one of those first spots to open up? You see someone coming with their cart. I say buggy. I don't know if they say buggy in Memphis. I call it a buggy. You see someone with their buggy, and you just like slowly follow them to their car just so you can get the best space there? Or do you park at the end of the row to make space for others? People who might not be able to walk that far, or people with kids who have a lot of stuff with them. How do you show up in the parking lot? When you get inside, how do you treat the workers? It's aggravating time to be engaged with people in public right now, right? Those people at the store, do you look down upon them because they are stocking shelves for a living? Or do you treat them with kindness? Say hello. Show some gratitude. When you are undoubtedly going down an aisle that is filled with too many people and too many shopping carts, how do you respond? I'll tell you how I respond. I huff and I roll my eyes. It looks like this. I go, <sighs> how do you respond to that? It will happen, right? Can you think of a moment more normal, more basic, and more bursting with the possibility to be a follower of Jesus than a crowded grocery store aisle. And then when you finally get your stuff, look at your cart and ask yourself, did you only buy what you needed? We're bombarded with coupons and advertisement telling us that we need all sorts of things we don't need, right? like brand new Ranger Bass Boats. But when you go to the grocery store, do you only buy what you need? And when you buy what you need, do you then buy something for someone else who might not have everything that they need? And when you go to check out, how patient are you? I was already going to talk about this, and yesterday my wife and son went to a store, a grocery store, I won't tell you the name, but it rhymes with Palmart, and stood in the checkout aisle for almost an hour. How do we respond in those moments? Have we been planting seeds just to please ourselves so we can become frustrated and justified in our righteousness? We have better things to do than stand in line at this store. Or do we somehow find a source of patience and kindness and gentleness? Especially to the people who have had to put up with 30 people coming through their lives. 
And I don't know if it is sowing to please the Spirit, but a personal pet peeve of mine, when you are all done grocery shopping and they are in your, your groceries are in your car, do you put your cart back? I know that sounds very basic. I know it sounds simple. I know when we go to church, we want big, powerful things, miracles. But really, we encounter basic life moments more than anything. And think, if you will, that if we responded like that at the grocery store, how different our lives would be. How different this world would be if we could be people of kindness and patience in the most frustrating moments of life. Do you think the world would have a little bit more grace and peace in it. Now, I don't know if you're going to go to the grocery store this week. Maybe you're like Jeff and you just push a button these days, but you will face something this week, some moment that you think is just a basic, normal life thing. And it will gauge where you are sowing your seeds and how you are planting. It will tell you whether you've been planting to please the flesh or planting to please the spirit. And that's really, really important, y'all, because we get here, we sing songs, we have an awesome band, we have amazing people who come up here and pray and fill this space with the spirit. And if that doesn't change who we are, we have no reason to be gathering here on Sunday mornings. Does your life look differently? Because you are trying to follow Jesus. Does your life look differently? Because you are planting seeds to please the Spirit. That gets to the heart of the whole thing. Are you pleasing? Are you sowing? To please the flesh? Or are you sowing to please the Spirit? Let us pray. Holy God, we ask that you open our eyes to the small moments in life so that we may intentionally follow you that we may plant seeds of kindness and mercy, of gentleness and graciousness, of love and joy. May we have the courage, God, to be those people. May we let this space change who we are. And may we follow deeper and deeper into this way of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. At this time, we invite you to gather your elements for communion.